coming up. It's been raining mayoral minutes at this month's council meeting. Find out what went down from Mayor Teresa Harding. Council appoints an acting CEO. The Smart City program is perhaps not so smart after all. And privately owned land at Bellbird Park is not part of the city's Enviroplan future. It's Monday, March 29, 2021, and I'm Alan Roebuck. Welcome to Ipswich Today, which acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which it is produced and pays respects to elders past, present and emerging. This podcast is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. The March meeting of Ipswich City Council was held on Thursday the 25th and Mayor Teresa Harding joins me now. Thanks for talking with Ipswich today, Mayor Harding. Thank you for the invitation, Alan. You presented three mayoral minutes at this month's meeting, but firstly, what is a mayoral minute? Yeah, look, a mayoral minute is, uh, I guess, a, a, one of the privileges of being a mayor. Um, it allows me to bring an item to the very front of the agenda. And then also, when I, when I put the motion forward, it also means it's been moved and seconded, which means it can be discussed. Um, so the mayoral minute does take precedence over all other business, and it allows me either to do things at short notice, but, but I think every other time, I've, I've, every time I've used it, but I've always shared with the councillors um, what I'm going to be doing, and I usually send it to them as well. But it is a way of us dealing with things in a, in a timely manner, but also it's, it's also a way for myself to bring forward items that I think are really important for our city. Interestingly enough, I don't recall any mayoral minutes being used in the previous couple of councils, so it's a pretty powerful instrument just sitting there to be used strategically. It is, and I've only used it at a few uh, council meetings, but I think uh, the three mayoral minutes that I brought forward were very important. And what did you put to councillors this month? The first thing was to do the um, to announce who the acting CEO will be for the next four to six months. The next one was to outline how we'll do that recruitment for an ongoing CEO. And also, thirdly, was how to address the shortfall that we have now current as an Anzac Day commemoration policy. I was particularly interested in that civic events uh, uh, discussion. I I get the feeling that the heart and soul of council decisions were completely removed when the city was under administration. This, to me, appears as though councillors are firmly putting their stamp on restoring the heart and soul of council. I guess the previous council were dismissed because of lack of governance, and that certainly has come through with the the policies. I mean, that the Anzac Day policy is a, a... I guess, a, a one in one case. Um, the previous policy was updated by the administration in 2019, which included support to one of the RSL sub-branches. But the one before that was written in 1996, which basically um, the only support for Anzac Day was a booklet signed by the CEO. So it's probably really important for us as a new council to um, do the right thing, get it in policy, and it's really important that um, community organisations know that they can rely on support from council rather than relying on their relationships with councillors and, and discretionary funds. You mentioned that a, an acting CEO uh, is appointed or has been appointed. That's Sonia mm. Cooper. Why the need for an acting CEO? Well, to recruit for a CEO on going will probably take four to six months, depending on um, if how long it will take for them to leave another job. And so, it's really important for us to have that leader in our organisation to make sure that the organisation keeps working as as, as efficiently as it does. Son is a current general manager in our organisation. She's a former CEO of the State Library and was the interim State Librarian as well. And formerly, she's also a Deputy Public Service Commissioner in the Queensland Government. So she she's been here for over a year and uh, she. She's also been very much spearheading our work in um, that, that culture change, transformation, and also implemented the work on the Transparency and Integrity Hub. So I think it's a really good uh, fit for our organisation. I, I get the fact that it will take a while to recruit a CEO because if you want a good one, they're probably already working. But for the Absolutely. benefit of residents, when you get to the pointy end of that selection process, how is a CEO finally selected by Ipswich City Council? Yeah, look, we have a panel, my, myself, the Deputy Mayor, um, Marnie Doyle and Councillor Andrew Fechner and Councillor Jacob Madsen and an independent will be uh, forming that panel with support from a professional HR company. Um, we'll do all the shortlisting interviews, but we'll go to the final two or three. Uh, we'll, the entire council will um, interview those final uh, two or three applicants and make that decision as a council. A report to Council on the Smart City Program was 11 months in the making. What is or was the Smart City Program? 
Look, I think there's a real opportunity that we lost here in Ipswich. Um, we had that opportunity to really jump ahead, but unfortunately what we can see is that $4.7 million of ratepayers' money was spent on this. Uh, $1.4 million of that was just spent on a document called a blueprint. Um, it's really disappointing to see that really there is no uh, benefit to, to the residents from that. There's been no um, data kept to see if there were any efficiencies or how things actually help people in the community. I think it's really important for us to... So, and I also note that over $350,000 uh, was spent um, on overseas trips, which did include councillors, such as Paul Pasali, Andrew Antonelli and Paul Tully. So I think it's really, really important um, that we remember the lessons of the past to make sure that we, we, we don't do that in the future. I mean, when you're seeing things like this and they're, they're shrouded in mystery, you've got to ask, you know, you can see why the community would see this as a junket. And I think if we're going to spend that kind of money, you really have to show that there's a benefit to the community. You said many cities have moved on from smart city programs and Ipswich has not. What are those cities doing post-smart city approaches? Well, obviously, they've captured the lessons of the, of the, of the, the um, past and they're embracing technology, digital technologies and other ways. One thing that we're, I think we're leading the last 12 months is certainly with the Transparency and Integrity Hub. We are the only council in Australia that's using this technology to make sure that our books are open and people can see exactly how we're spending ratepayers' money. Council's free Wi-Fi in public spaces is part of the program. It's probably the most tangible part of the program. Should that, yes. we, should that free Wi-Fi continue? Um, our job as, as, uh, as a council is just to make sure that our residents receive really great services and so with every budget we always look through every line item and if it's being heavily used then that would continue. Um, at the moment I'm not getting any calls for that to be halted or stopped um, and I think it's being widely used. Apart from free Wi-Fi, are there any parts of the Smart City program still operating? Yeah, there are. There's about, of the 107 devices that were put in, about 43 are still going um, and we'll be getting a report on how they are going because at the moment they're being put there and we actually have no visibility of how they're operating. Are they, have they made our services more efficient? Has, has it improved things for, the, for residents? Uh, we need to get that information so we can see if there are any opportunities there. Looking at the report overall, what has been learnt by Council? Well, the previous Council sacked because of their failure of governance and this is just another one of those where they just spent so much money um, when you really can't see real tangible benefits to the community and I think it's really important for us as a new council to uh, learn those lessons and be really be really sure that how we spend money and make sure that if we do find opportunities such as the Smart Cities Blueprint did come up with a number of opportunities but council didn't follow through um, and, and I guess take advantage of that and leverage those opportunities. So it's really important for us as we move forward that when we see those opportunities that we, we grab them with both hands but also make sure that there is a benefit to the community. A drug and alcohol policy for councillors has been hanging around for a few meetings now. Is this dragging out unnecessarily? Um, just to let you know that for all us councillors, uh, in our Code of Conduct for Standard Behaviour, uh, 1.5, uh, we are not allowed to be doing our job impaired by alcohol or any other substances, so that's already in there for, for us. Uh, this is coming down to a testing regime and we feel very strongly that we need to follow the same regime um, that the council officers are doing and the council's going through a process for that. Um, what has also come out too is that from, from, from the lawyers is with the new Human Rights Act that came out last year that there are also implications for testing where people can say they don't want to be tested. So we're trying to unravel that but please know that obviously the Code of Conduct stands for all of us councillors and uh, we are obviously b b adhering to that and um, the CEO will be coming back to us with an update on how we can get a, uh, work with this um, mandatory testing um, system. A recommendation that Council does not go ahead and buy a parcel of land in Bellbird Park was approved by the majority of councillors. This land in question is privately owned. It's been the subject of fairly intense lobbying by a local group of residents trying to hold back mm. the tide of development. Why did Council decide not to buy this land in Bellbird Park? Yeah, we've discussed it quite a bit and you can see that the, the two Division 2 councils voted against it, um, you know, to, to stand up for their residents. Um, it was a really tough one for us um, because the land had been zoned as residential since 1994. Um, in fact, the residents who live around there their homes were also bushland b before. Uh, we have a, a strategic plan with our Enviro plan, um, strategic plan, to make sure that we preserve natural habitat 
That land in particular, because it's already designed for residential, has quite a high market value. And if we did spend that money there, it means we couldn't do a whole heap of work um, in other parts of Ipswich, so including Woogaroo Creek and, and things like that. So um, overall for the city, the council has decided not to proceed with that particular purchase, but that we'll be proceeding with the other purchases as part of the Enviro plan, um, purchasing plan. Another wash-up from the previous council is the massive collection of memorabilia purchased at a number of charity auctions. What is council going to do with all that memorabilia? Yeah, look, the Triple C have now given us clearance to um, dispose of those items. Um, these were items obviously part of the um, court cases and, and, and things like that, so they're no longer proceeds of crime. There are 755 items there, and we're just going to allow that to be disposed of in accordance with um, council um, and statutory uh, regulations and the money that comes in will go to a special community development fund so I really think it's really important that that money that comes in from the sale of those items is given back to the community. I see that there's practical completion on the new admin building in the Nicholas Street precinct and the building itself now has an official name. It sure does it will be called One Nicholas Street. It's a nice easy name uh, Mayor Harding does council have to go through any other processes or procedures to make that official? Oh, there's some um, stuff that we'll be notifying the state government and so on. But, yeah, we're really excited about the, the new name there. Um, we also surveyed our council staff uh, as they'll be working in that, in that building and 54% uh, preferred the name One Nicholas Street to City of Ipswich Administration Building. So um, it was really exciting to, to have a new name. It's one of those rare things you get to do um, and look forward to... Um, hopefully the people coming through and, and seeing it in, in June. It certainly has a nice ring to it. You know, there's one William, now one Nicholas Street, Ipswich. Yeah, look, I think it maintains a professional standard for the business community um, who will also be tenants on one of the floors as well. There were some other names decided. Can you give us an update on those? Yeah, on the, the first floor there, there's an event space there that um, there'll be a lunchroom for staff, but also it can be hired out for, for functions. And we've named that the Dandiri Room. Dandiri is a local Indigenous name for meat. So we thought it was a great way of, you know, a meeting room. Um, and the terrace, um, the, the balcony on the edge there is being named Bremer Terrace. So hopefully um, it's a nod to the beautiful river that you'll see uh, from the terrace there. And um, I think they'll be really well utilised um, in future years by the community. Mayor Harding, that's an extensive update, but not a complete update from a very big meeting in March. Thanks for speaking with Ipswich today. Thank you very much, Alan, for the time. At the same council meeting, Councillor Paul Tully clarified he was not part of the USA and Japan trip highlighted in the Smart City report. Here's what he had to say during those discussions with Mayor Harding. I'll just make a, a comment in relation to um, uh, a trip um, referred to on uh, page 302 of... Um, of the council agenda. Um, I'm certainly not mentioned there. That mm. was a trip to Japan and USA. Mm. Uh, I'll just uh, might put it on the record that I was, was not part of yes. that trip. Were you part of the New Zealand trip? Um, I was part of a New Zealand trip, mm -hmm. whether it's mentioned there or not. That was a, a two or three days, um, my recollection. But just for the sake of I think of it's complete... a 2015 trip, August 2015. Yeah, just, just for completeness, for people who are reading that report, mm -hmm. I was not not part of that uh, Japan-USA trip. After all that, councillors voted unanimously that the report be received and contents noted. You'll find handy links in the show notes for council meeting agendas and minutes, council's YouTube channel and the current works program. Ipswich Today is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. This podcast is also listener supported. Please make a once only gift or regular donation to help keep it online. Just go to ipswichtoday.com.au and click the donate button at the bottom of the page. You can follow this podcast on your favourite app, including iHeartRadio, or play Ipswich Today from your smart speaker. Music is supplied by Purple Planet Music. This is Alan Roebuck. Thanks for listening. <laughs>